Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University. Today I'm talking with Laurier's newest teaching fellow, Rochelle Monahan from Laurier's Community Health and Biology programs. Laurier's teaching fellows are educational leaders who inspire their students and their colleagues with impactful pedagogical approaches. They collaborate across our communities to share insights into their evolving practice as they continue to contribute to leading edge research into the scholarship of teaching and learning. Rochelle is a passionate teacher who puts her students at the center of her entire teaching practice. She blends innovative teaching practices with compassion, inclusion, and support for students that goes beyond her classroom. Her creative and reflective approach to teaching and learning makes her a dynamic new addition to the Laurier Teaching Fellowship. And I'm excited to get to know more about her journey that led her here. I'm going to start um, by asking you about your commitment to inclusivity and community okay. in your classroom. Yes. Uh, and how do you go about creating that? Like concretely, what do you do? What do you plan for? I'd also love to know more about why you value it and yeah. if you see it changing over the courses that you teach, over the years that you teach. Uh, so just generally interested in knowing about your evident commitment to building inclusivity, inclusivity and connection. And connection community. Yeah, community in the classroom. Like, why does that matter? A lot of us don't attend to it particularly, but you do, so it yeah. must have some consequence for the outcomes you see in your students. Yeah, I really see, um, like so many of my students are have goals of being in healthcare. It requires, and it requires a team. Like, there's always a team. Yes. And, and so, um, so yes, you can have individuals in the classroom that are focused. This is my goal. I'm just going to focus on meeting my goals and I don't want to engage in this community stuff. And I try and give those options, uh, to people when, like, cause that's what they need. Those are their goals. Uh, just because I want to create community in the classroom doesn't mean that it's necessarily student uh, goals, but when, and I, and I think at the beginning of term, I typically do not see community as part of the student goal. When I inspire it, they start to buy into it and they see how working as a team makes them a better individual student. And that is the same in healthcare, I believe, like or in other any other field that's, that requires a team, that when you collectively pool information and problem solve, then you're really drawing from all the options that you have. And that promotes inclusivity in that community build. Right. But, um, but some people choose not to participate in community and because that works for them or at least they think that works for them. And, and uh, you know, I'm also about as much as I have goals that I would like to have in the classroom, I have to recognize that students are coming in with their own goals. Like what is their education for them and why are they there? And sometimes it's not to build community. It's just to come in, check the boxes, get out. <laughs> and I, I hope that's not the case. I try to inspire a lot more than that. That's the, that's the point. Yeah. Um, but in terms of inclusivity, I mean, there's, there's representation, right? And so this is something that in science, women typically wouldn't have been represented or um, people of color or indigenous people or like, any, any of any groups of people, um, there are all kinds of them that were not included in, in the sciences. And so while it seems like a very superficial gesture, every single lecture I provide where I, I have lots of photos in my, in my um, lectures, um, and on my lecture slides, mostly they're image-based and not text-based that I speak around and talk to because of uh, photo, uh, picture superiority effect. <laughs> so we, we do remember, we were communicating with pictures and drawings long before we were communi communicating in the written word. And as long as it's a, it's, a, it's a concrete image, it's not an abstract image, right. our brains can associate information with that concrete image and parts of that concrete image in such an important way. And so using images in that way is just as valuable as text as long as they're concrete. And having uh, pictures of representing all people in my lectures 
and I would really like to have, you know, it would nice to have, it would be nice to have like photo um, kind of repositories that we could make sure that we're pulling from. In anatomy, just recently, it was hitting the news that, wow, we're having, even in the illustrations in anatomy textbooks, they're not all Caucasian people. Yes. I mean, yeah. Even or body types. Or body types, ages. exactly. Yeah. Ages, exactly. Yeah. These are all the, and so that's exactly what I try to represent. Body type, ages, different rep skin colors, different um, abilities, like different all kinds of things that I'm trying to represent so that people see themselves in science, see themselves studying anatomy and not just the patient or not just, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. So, um, and then I've learned so much from students. I mean, that's, that's, the resource that yeah. I have that is that are just incredible Part of the privilege of being yes, an educator right? exactly yeah. and um, I've had the opportunity to uh, teach so many people with so many backgrounds and um, and I have a former student who um, and she refers to herself as this as blind and uh, I would say visually impaired but she says no I'm blind I can't see anything so um, and um, and I she happened to be in my class for introductory uh, introductory biology I was in charge of running the chemistry labs I wasn't teaching the chemistry but running the chemistry labs that she took cell and molecular biology anatomy physiology pathophysiology all of these sciences that are very visual and um, we work together it wasn't me teaching her a certain way. It was we worked together to make sure that I could meet her needs. And what happened in the process was once I realized, so I, if I'm putting up an image, like traditionally putting up an image that I would expect all the sighted people in the room to be able to see. Right. Because they don't have a visual impairment or most of them don't have a visual impairment. Um, and it's fully labeled and it's colored and it's, you know, in my opinion, from my lens, um, there's all this information on there that is right there in front of them that of course they can see. It wasn't until I was teaching somebody who couldn't see it and I had to describe and explain these processes and images, the, the, the processes that the images were conveying to somebody who couldn't see them that I realized my sighted students could not see the images either because they weren't experts. Oh, okay, right. Yes. <laughs> so yes, it's labeled, and yes, they can see the red part of the pink part of the labeled part, but what does that mean if they don't have the understanding behind it? And so, so in learning how to work with, and, and um, I would say my, the student taught me just as much, or if not more than I taught her, but she, uh, she also taught me how, to, how important it is to fully explain things as if somebody can't see them even when they can because they're not seeing it through my eyes so that was i mean <laughs> the so trying to promote inclusivity in the class actually like it, it was all the way around it, it helped me become a better teacher it helped my sighted students be able to understand the information that i've been teaching for years in a certain way and now teaching in a different way and continue to teach now you know it's that iterative process of teaching where i'm always learning like a better way to do it or trying a different way to make it better. Yeah, and I, I find a lot of people talk about their the sort of developmental path that they find they follow as an educator as being layered or scaffolded in that way, right? That, it, you know, often in our careers we begin in our teaching practice probably as a, a graduate TA um, to to focus on the on the content and making sure that the content is structured well and delivered well and then over time you start paying a little bit more attention to some of the surrounding literature some of the teaching practices that you're observing or experiencing and start to incorporate those in but something different happens when you start paying attention to how the students are learning yes. as a consequence of how you're deciding to teach subject matter in the course and it sounds like you've had both that um, so sort of deepening of practice around uh, helping students to know the value of being able to work in collaboration, to learn socially, because of its connection to interprofessional practice and problem solving in subsequent roles, and also your, your integration of UDL principles mm -hmm. into your teaching, because you were learning from your students. Yes, and thinking yeah. about your course uh, from that position of uh, empathy about so this is how I'm intending to teach. 
how am I observing my students are actually learning and yeah. to make adjustments in that. And it, you know, when you articulate it in that way, it sounds so simple, but it's not necessarily as obvious in terms of, of what is productive practice as you grow as an educator. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about how you learn as a teacher? Because now as a teaching fellow, you're clearly somebody who has invested a great deal um, and, and worked on this both as a, a craft and a knowledge base with a great deal of, of joy and enthusiasm and creativity, so. Yeah, oh, and I think I can share a bit of a funny story going back first, to go backwards first to, to then speak to now. When I first, um, I was at, I was, uh, when I was working on my PhD, there was a certificate in university teaching, you know, kind of program that I thought, well, I need that on my CV. You know, it wasn't about teaching. It was about, I need that on my CV and I need to demonstrate that I care about teaching. And I did care about teaching as far as I knew, but I didn't think um, there was much to it. I mean, I had, you know, I was in, you know, grade 35 or whatever at this point. Yeah. I, know what I, you know, I don't know how many yeah. educators I had experienced and yeah. uh, the gamut of, of what I thought was quality teaching or effective teaching and, and, and otherwise. And so, um, so I thought, but you know, so I'll go through the checklist, kind of like some of the yeah. students I was talking about yeah. at the beginning there. And, um, but within the first kind of uh, course or workshop of module of that certificate, it was wow. like, wow. I have yeah. so <laughs> much to learn. Yeah. And, and, and I really, really uh, became dedicated to that as the other science I was studying. <laughs> and so, um, and it is a creative and expansive space. Yes. Right. And it's when a I find fun, fun yeah. sandbox, yes, it's a fun sandbox. And I, I'll find literature where I'm thinking, yes, this is, I, I was practicing this and I didn't have the theoretical underpinning behind it. And now I understand why, like, this is a great way to describe it. And then you'll come up with another, another paper and think, oh, there's another theory that really describes this. And so, you, so I know that's a little bit backward, um, but that's how some of it happens. And then other times it's just like, I need to find an answer. And so you start diving through the literature, trying to find curiosity, as curiosity yeah. and yeah. then you have it all out and you're like, well, this doesn't tell me how to do it, but it gives me some theoretical underpinnings and concepts yes. for me to start thinking and problem solving what I'm trying to accomplish in the classroom. So I do it kind of backwards <laughs> sometimes where I find evidence to, and I'm not, I'm not saying that that's scientific, but it's, it's, it's like, yeah, this is, this makes sense to me. Um, I'm sure there's some other literature out there that might not. But right? anyway, you, you did it both backwards and forwards, and forwards. because <laughs> you also decided to go uh, on and take a doctorate of education on top of your PhD in, in discipline. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about what prompted that and, and how it fed you as an educator, how it served you? I am so glad to have done that. And I mean, there's part of it when you've done it, when you've already completed a terminal degree, it's kind of like, why are you doing another <laughs> terminal degree? Um, part of that was the, my career trajectory at the university because I was at Brantford where there isn't graduate programming um, or there wasn't at the time when yes, I was yeah. really, when I started. Um, and I, here I was in a tenure stream position, trained to be a laboratory researcher and and at the same time, I didn't have graduate students to really do that work with. And the, the needs of my job were to be teaching, undergraduate teaching, connecting with um, a diverse undergraduate uh, cohort of students and, and, um, and really trying to, so, so that's where I was like, this, it makes sense for me to have a terminal degree in education if that's what my job actually is. And so my, my um, position was then a, a PTP, professional um, teaching, teaching position. Yeah. And, uh, and so because of that, I thought it still seems to make sense that, <laughs> that I have a terminal degree in that area. And, um, and I thought ultimately are there ways in which I might be able to influence, and this is why also why it matters to me being a fellow and not that I couldn't do it without being a fellow, but I think, are there ways in which to, you know, start conversations with people or influence uh, ways in people think about or approach their teaching where they're excited to try something or they're 
or they're open to talking about it because because that's actually where most of my teaching has grown or expanded when I've been chatting with people who are passionate about teaching. Yep. And all of a sudden I'll say something and something that I'm pretty excited about and someone will say, that's a really neat idea. Have you ever thought of this? Yes. And, and it's either to add on or it's to help me think critically about what I was just excited about. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and, and to make me take pause and reflect and go, wow, I never thought of it that way now. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And sometimes our best resource as educators is down the hall. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, and it just opens up uh, lenses of analysis into our decision around how we're structuring our courses or building out learning activities or designing assessments. And then you can dig deeper. You can yeah. look into the foundational literature, both in terms of the theoretical underpinnings of the approach, but also then the practical application of that and look at examples from colleagues. Um, but we really have to set those conversations up intentionally. And, yeah. and I think perhaps being a fellow will be one of the things that will um, sort of invite those conversations. And exactly. Invite the knock on your door yeah. um, or, or just, uh, you know, kind of inspire you to lean in some doorways as well and just have conversations about what's happening in the classroom. We have conversations routinely about what's going on in our labs, what's happening with our research, and we don't necessarily have the same <laughs> conversations about what's going on in our teaching. It, it has uh, a bit of gauze around it for, for whatever reason. So I yeah. think that that's one of the really uh, great opportunities tied with the fellowship model is that uh, people then recognize that they have this great resource in their midst. Yes. And yeah. will maybe say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to chat her up. I'm curious <laughs> about this. I, I see this happening in her course or um, that she was talking about universal design for learning or inclusive teaching practice or, um, you know, some of the more innovative and creative work that you do in your courses. Um, so I, I'd love to talk about uh, one of the ways into that creativity in, in your teaching practice um, by prompting you to tell us a little bit about what you aspire to develop in students as future scientists okay. and what your thoughts are on cultivating science literacy and science communication capacities in our Laurier grads. So the communication part, I think, is absolutely essential. And when I teach upper year courses, which I haven't been recently because I've te anatomy is second year courses, I guess that's senior, but it's still, um, uh, then that's where I really encourage that communication more. Anatomy tends to be a lot of content. It's just, it is essentially learning a, just a massive alphabet. And so it's one of, one of the challenges that I have for students um, especially in our Google era is that when they're like, why, why on earth do I actually need to have this information in my head when I can just look it up online and I can have this information in 30 seconds? And the level of information in a second year human anatomy class is Googleable because it is foundational. Mm -hmm. It is the alphabet yes. of our problem solving. But just like an, the actual you know, 26 letter alphabet, you need to memorize that and understand what those letters sound like or what they do in order to make words, sentences, paragraphs, essays. Yeah. And human anatomy is just a massive alphabet for that problem solving and an integration of, con of content. So yeah, you can look up where this muscle attaches uh, in 30 seconds. And, and if that's the level that you'll always have to do, yeah. but as a healthcare provider, you're never just thinking about just, or very rarely thinking of just that one muscle and nothing else, not the circulation, not the nervous system that attaches to yes. it, not all the other muscles that are that, and how this influences the body on a three dimensional level. You can't even begin to think about that if you don't have that information as part of your knowledge base, right? The anatomy part. And so um, I really, part of what I want students to get to is really really understanding their um, responsibility in learning and that it isn't memory work that it is actually foundation building yes and yeah. it's sure is there you know from a explicit and declarative memory of course you're using these parts of the brain and all of this yeah. kind of stuff but but how do we 
how do we take it to more than just that? And, I, and then I want students to understand their unique experiences, their amazingness, the fact that they've been, you know, whether that's dancing, cheerleading, skating, hockey, you know, football, all these types of sports that somebody might do, chess player or euchre, like, yeah, people are, like, these students are experts. They've been, they, for 18 years, sometimes they've been doing all kinds of amazing things. Yes. And are experts far beyond my expertise, like, you know, in those areas. That, that if they take this information that I need them to learn to, as the foundation, they will have a unique lens so that once we get to the problem solving part, there is going to be something that that individual student might be able to problem solve that no one else can problem solve yes. because of their unique experience. This isn't just rote memorization. This is how do you integrate this with who you are and what you want to accomplish, right? Yes. And that is really hard to do when we're balancing the culture of credentialing, making sure that GPA is a certain amount to get into whatever professional school you're trying to get into, because sometimes there's a disparity between the type of learning you do for that GPA yes. credential and the type of learning you do for that integration. And, and I try and bring yeah. them all together. <laughs> yeah, and also help students to fully appreciate for themselves on their own basis yes. the value of yes. that deeply. Yeah, so, there's, um, there's a great colleague, um, uh, from the UK, Christopher Winch, who talks about different forms of knowledge, and one of them being knowledge that, right, is is that um, sort of process-driven knowledge, and then there's also just the lower level of acquaintance knowledge. You know there is an alphabet yes. in anatomy. Knowledge that is that that component of anatomy has a function. But then there's uh, a deeper level of knowledge, uh, propositional knowledge, where you have that fluency and that capacity and you really understand um, both what its purpose is, what its function is, what its disease paths are, um, how it changes over time. You understand the, the history of understanding of that from a human perspective. And it, it starts to dig into your framework for how you go about being in the world. Yes. Right? Yeah. That, that is that level of literacy uh, that fluency, that facility with the knowledge and that integrated sort of critical perspective. It's transformation. That, it is. And it it's is so powerful yeah. for people once they possess it. And so I think often so difficult for us as educators to, to, um, to hold it up for them and say, this is, this is the, what, what you want. Yeah. This is the stuff over here. Yeah. Um, and, and to model that and, and purposefully pull them toward it through curriculum is a real, a real craft for yes. educators. Yeah, yeah I, I think in that transformational component is, is what I also want for students where, I mean, if, they're, if, if their personal goal is to you know, pay their tuition fee yeah, and to walk out with the credit and ultimately yeah. add up their credits and walk out with their piece of paper. That's that's unfortunate because I think while that piece of paper is going to look the same as somebody else's piece of paper who has had transformational learning. Yes, the transformational learning when somebody walks into class and uh, one of the my, one of my favorite questions to ask students when we're in the last week of class or when we've had kind of the last major assessment that before before I'm you know not going to see them anymore before yeah. the end of term I'm like can you imagine doing that assessment on the first day of class and everybody bursts out laughing as in like there is no way I would have been able to do that and <laughs> yeah. and and they've it's it's getting them into their recognition of what they have how worked at moved. what they've yeah. how far they've moved that there's transformation. Yeah. What is the point of taking, a, in my opinion, of taking an educational credit where you have the same perspective, essentially same knowledge base, come essentially out unscathed. The, come out unscathed without uh, any yeah. change yes. on the other side, without any transformation on the other side. And there's that quotation that I, that I really, I, I don't know it exactly, but it's essentially a mind that stretched to a new idea never returns to its original dimensions. Yes. And I love that because it, it implies that transformation. It implies 
when you're actually doing that work and learning and this new idea, you you can't unsee it. You're, yeah, you have it's a, a new threshold lens. concept. Yes, is, yes, exactly. Is the theoretical framework in education for that yes, very Myers idea. and land, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. That there are within every discipline those really complex, uh, consequential processes, um, theories, knowledge bases that are very difficult to to um, to transition toward as a learner, but once you have it, yeah. you can't forget it. Everything else looks differently afterwards. And it so just... that piece of paper for those students, yes. and, and I, I know that I can't get everybody there because that's not everybody's goals. Um, but the, the students that, and I, but I, and I think there's ones that that is their goal. And I think there's yeah. ones that I can inspire it to be their goal. And yeah. th that's really actually exciting part too, where they weren't thinking about that. They didn't yeah. know about that. And then when they realize, oh, this is not just about credentialing and checking the boxes. This is transforming myself. Yes. Yeah. This yeah. is the, and that's exciting because the ones that already know that, that's exciting too because you just get to watch it happen. Like yeah. they're, they're already. Yeah, it, it's so true. <laughs> we we don't always get the privilege of seeing that moment in our students because it, it can come the next term or several years down the road or even yes. after they've graduated and moved on. Um, but yeah, to know that it's there is, is uh, that you've laid the groundwork for it is, yes. is hugely consequential as an educator. Yeah. And I think um, the other part, and it does tie back into community, is that, um, that if you're really engaging and working on this transformation, like transformational learning, it gets the dopamine going, it's the excitement and working in community. I mean, not all learning is fun. It can be a lot of slogging through some difficult yes. like concepts, but when you get to the other side, it's that it's that dopamine yeah. rush, right? And so, yeah. and and so, I think that working like people celebrating and supporting each other and getting there in a classroom is important, and that um, that sense of safety that we're all doing this together is why another reason why I like community promoting the community in the classroom because um, a lot of healthcare fields and courses can be very competitive and actually not supportive of, um, of each other. And so by making sure that we're going in and, and it's like, this is, this is a positive learning environment. People should be coming in here and feeling like this is a fun place to be. It might not be fun work all the time, but it's like, I know that I'm being supported. I know that if I'm having challenges, somebody's going to hear me you know, or that sort of thing. So that's another reason that, and that's nice for people to know, not just in the classroom, but if you can build that in the classroom, they know that's possible outside the classroom too. So can you talk a little bit about how you purposefully structure that within say an anatomy lab when you're having the students work in groups? Yeah. What do you do? What do you say? What do you think of in advance? How do you structure the activity yeah, that so that happens? Well, everything right from the syllabus. The syllabus does have clear expectations that unfortunately sometimes are written with the lens and I have to try and remind myself, I want the tone of this to be exciting. This is their first kind of input into the, into the course or the kind of exposure to the course. But I also need to make sure that the expectations are clear. And, you know, so like the tone of the syllabus is something I care a great deal about. Yes. Um, that it's supportive, that it's community. And then in the classroom, physical classroom, and I am very excited about being in the physical classroom. I still tried my best in digital, in the virtual world, but um, I think every student, I don't care if it's 300 students or five students or whatever, like if it's a little seminar or something, everybody needs to be seen. And, and so there's some work in what is called high quality connections. And it doesn't require sharing life stories. It doesn't require uh, handshakes or even speaking. It can be nonverbal as well, but people need to be seen in the class. And that I convey just through w seeing people come in the door, eye contact. Um, and I do talk to people in, in the time that's available. And I talk to people that are at the back and in the sides. And, 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 I, and I think initially when I do that, it can be uncomfortable for students because they don't know me, but I try and do it very safely and just sort of, oh, that's a really neat backpack or you know something like yeah. that. Just sort of that, we're, that I'm seeing them. Right, and yes. Yeah. yeah, and that creating that sense of community just by being seen is really important yeah or um and and I try my best like I know students names very quickly 
actually what I did learn is that I know if they, because of human nature, they sit in the same spots. I know the name associated with the space before I actually know the name associated with the person, which I think is kind of fascinating. Yes. And I have some yeah. theories about physical textbooks versus digital textbooks and memory about that. But anyways, that's another, <laughs> I could go on and on about that. Um, but I, but I learn their names quickly. Um, and then I also, so calling people by name, just acknowledging everybody that's in the classroom. And then, um, and occupying classroom space differently yes. and doing so from the outset instead <laughs> yes. of creating Not that, yes. yeah, that zone of relational, uh, sort of hegemony yes. that we create when we <laughs> just go right to the front of the classroom and, and only sort of, you know, move around in that space at the front of the classroom. It's amazing how the dynamic can change yep. if you uh, move about the space. Yes. Okay. And sometimes, especially, well, especially after being virtual for a couple of years, like I love being in the classroom, but always Ever, ever since I started teaching, the first week, the first class for sure, the first week, I'm like trying to get used to my new teaching space. And I might not be like, I have the discomfort as well as, oh, I've got 300 new people to meet or I have, you know, and so, uh, so I make sure that, that I'm trying to keep my discomfort invisible. I know like I, I the rest of the time I'm very in the first week. And, and then I'm very, I'm very open about how I feel and who I am. But in that first week, I don't want students perceiving my discomfort because I know they're actually like, I, yeah. it's, it, they need to worry about themselves, not yeah. about like, <laughs> <this Yeah. kid. laughs> so, um, but if there's something that comes up in, in a classroom or it might just be a really in, with news or things like that, because we can't separate our classroom from what's going on outside the yes. world. And there's yeah. lots of connections with that. And so sometimes there'll be news that comes in and I'll just be like, oh, I'm having a hard time with this information and how to process it. And I bet other people are too, because then, it, then I'm, you know, connecting with what might be really challenging for people, or I might not even identify sometimes the news that is challenging for people and things like that. But I think that that makes it feel safe if I'm sharing, then they can share Absolutely. and things like that. Yeah. That first week though, I try to, I'm just trying to keep myself kind of neutral yeah. <laughs> so that they can. Well, yeah. And space. So building comfort, building familiarity, establishing yes. expertise. Yes. And um, establishing yeah. the kind of interactions that uh, you're anticipating and laying the groundwork for in the course. So yeah. that the course runs smoothly and that participation expectations are well set. Okay. And that the, the, the participation is often through play. And that can be really, really challenging for, you know, uh, and I don't, and I mean this in note, but, but really quite the serious intellectual students yes. that are gunning for certain goals and yes. like, why are we playing with pipe oriented. cleaners and yes. why are we coloring? And what is this is like, <laughs> I am actually in university planning on doing this very important job in the future. And I can't believe that I could be doing this in my kindergarten class. So, so really always ex explaining the why, why this affects your brain yes. at, or most people's brain. And if it doesn't affect your brain this way, guess what? I want you to choose something that will affect your brain the way that I'm trying to get. Yes. It's, so, so there's flexibility. So I'm like, uh, I'll often say, we're this is this is uh, when we, it was virtual. We were doing coloring, and everyone was like, "Are you serious? We're actually going to be coloring?" I'm like, "Yes, there's a reason though, and I'll yes. talk about this." And yes, we'll, exactly. And by the end of it, people were like, "I thought it was crazy, but I really learned a lot with this." And, uh, and, but I always said to people, if you are doing this and you are not finding any value in the exercise, a lot of people will, but not everybody. So then feel free to come up to me and say, I'd rather do this because I think this is going to help. Yeah, just do it. And that's, that's more important. Getting so you're to giving them license to take ownership for their quality of their own learning. Yes. I'm suggesting what I think are great ideas. <laughs> 
and that and, experience <laughs> and, and, and your research yes, and reading yeah. have taught you exactly, yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And 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 students might not even buy into it right away, but then they buy into it because they see that it's working. Yeah. And uh, but for some people, not everybody's going to work. And so I want like what a waste of time if I'm making them follow a process like sincerely if they're sincerely engaged and they're sincerely trying the process and it's not working then let's not go down that path yeah. and th that is um something that i think we acquire over time as educators as well is that ability to offer our students guidance through multiple pathways to learning like yes. that you can you can focus on the intended outcome that you're endeavoring for them to achieve before they leave the class that day what you want them in to have yep. in their back pocket on the way out um, but you can recognize that some are finding their way through the recommended path and others are not. And you can then approach that student and say, try it this way, consider doing it that way. That is um, something that I think is uh, sometimes difficult for us as developing educators to see how do you get from being able to propose or structure one learning activity to having the agility in the moment witnessing the quality of your students learning to say okay let's do it this way or okay let's try that or to yes. pause in a moment because you're observing that there's common struggle and to back up like to have that yeah. level of attention to the quality of student learning in the moment and the ability to say let's try this approach let's try that approach that's something that i think um all educators you know once you you we all strive for it once you try to uh, acquire that and accomplish it, that it can really be a huge change maker and how successful you feel in your teaching practice and, and how much fun you're having in the classroom. I'm, yeah, and that's one of the things that I'm, I'm having a blast coming up with these ideas, I think, and the students love the creativity and they, they realize they're being encouraged to have fun. And so it was really hard for some of my students to have fun in the class. Like it was like, do you mean exactly? And I'm like, no, I just mean to have fun. Yeah. So uh, because while you're having fun, you're 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 we can just we can let our our guard down, and we can just take this in as we're working together. Yeah. And so an example too of of you know part of this coloring, I was like, it, if it's not coloring, it's this, like just it's yeah. something meaningful. And uh, and at the end of one of the virtual classes. Um, the labs that I was doing, I asked those that are willing to turn their cameras on and, and show. show their artwork yeah. and we'll do a, like a, a photo as yes. long as I have, you know, your permission, yeah. then by, per, by turning on your camera, you'll yeah. give permission for this and uh, or whatever you've been working on. So it's not just the and in there, here's a student who had done the most incredible muscle artwork on his forearm, like as if right like, on. like <laughs> yeah. so it was all yeah. on on him. And it was, it was like, yes, that's like, that yeah. is it. Well, that's and, even more meaningful than like, like in some ways when somebody designs their own learning. And I understand not everybody mm -hmm. has the background or the context or sometimes just that day, the bandwidth to do it. They might be able to do it any other day, but that day they're just like, look, yeah. I just came in here. I want to drink my coffee. I showed up, that, you know. <laughs> yes, that tacit agreement about, yes, I'll be here if you don't ask too much of me in the moment. It does take some trust building to, yes. have, to convince students that know the dynamic in this course is going to be a little bit different. <laughs> exactly. um, you're going to actively engage in learning and I'm going to help you to see the evidence of your achievement. Yes. Right. So having done what you did by giving the students the ability to concretize their understanding of something through artwork diagrams on a, on a on an arm and then to have them pause and say, actually, I know this now. Yes. I get this now. I own it differently. That's something that I think is is a very cool insight to share with other educators. Yeah, I just had on that line too, I was well, I was teaching an introduction to forensic science course before, uh, or actually during the pandemic, but at the beginning at Brantford campus. And uh, it's a little bit different than what needs to be learned, well, a lot different than what needs to be learned for anatomy. And so 
um, one of the points of that course was, was to make sure that we were as promoting scientific literacy, that this was open to people without a science background, but we were doing science. I didn't fully explain in the syllabus that by the end of this course, you're actually going to know like D the molecule of DNA well enough to be able to describe it at the atomic level. Like they, people would have gone running for the hills. <laughs> like they, I would never have done that because it would have terrified them. And most people, their imposter syndrome around science yeah. is, is, um, and, and there's all kinds of uh, cultural reasons for that, gender, societal, yeah. you know, narratives that tell people they can and can't do something. And so I wanted this course to be part of like making people aware that they are scientists, right? And just, but it was delivered in a way that was completely different than I've ever mm -hmm. delivered. And one of the options was, um, so there, there were assessments and these tests uh, counted as parts of the um, the, uh, the final mark, but if you didn't want to write a single test during that, um, during the course, you had that option to do that per module. So, but what somebody had, it was called choose your own assessment, like choose your own adventure, but yes. it was called choose your own assessment. And for each module, there were learning objectives and people could, students could come and propose what they wanted to do instead of the assessment to demonstrate that they had met the learning objectives. And what came out of that was the most creative, incredible, you know, you, you know, deliverables. That Manifest these, to evidence yes, of learning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. From escape rooms to movies, like with like, like really well edited movies, yeah. like kind of like a CSI uh, forensics yeah. movie that this was all with the students and using you could see that they're demonstrating I know this this isn't just this isn't just regurgitating what's been done paintings I mean the options were there and so even in the painting I'm like as long as you can demonstrate molecular knowledge of this like is it ha yes. that happened to be the learning objective for yeah. or one of the learning objectives it's just incredible stuff and that's like how exciting for me to see people engage the way that they want to engage with the information um, in a way that is actually far more exciting for me to evaluate. <laughs> yes. right? yeah. Much harder on trying to, trying to create um, a consistency though. Like how do you compare somebody who has a, you know, certain grade on a task versus, and so at, versus it choose your own adventure. But I think there's, lots of ways to you, you begin you begin yeah. that journey and you learn along the way and I don't know if I, I I think I would say that there's just so much variability that you can't really come up with a rubric because these options are endless that somebody so then you have to have strong discussions on reflection yeah but I think like as an expert within discipline you understand what a student will be able to say or do or write yep. that would provide comfort that there is evidence of learning yeah. at at various levels of sophistication and i think if you you know as as a teacher if we pause for a moment and think about how would it look or mm -hmm. what would i hear or what would i read um, then that flexibility in the expression of learning is very much part of what we should be doing for universal design for learning it also gives our students some joy yeah uh in in uh creativity and innovation students were and excited about they, it they're more engaged right yeah. and, and it sounds as well that you um have really mastered that connection between social emotional and intellectual learning mm -hmm. in the discipline yeah i think and that's when people when you see students make those connections and their joy in learning starts to develop because they're making it meaningful for them. Like that's that's the emotional part, right? That's yes. their, and that's that's the fun part. And so when students have been like, they'll come in terrified of science, or there's no way I, I just I'm just I know that I'm just going to pass, or I, I'm or I'm, I don't know if I can even pass, like not even have the confidence to get the credit. It's like we can do this. This is. There's, there's very structured ways we can do yes. this or we can do this in ways, but ultimately you can do this and like coaching them through that. And then not only are they getting through it, they're starting to be excited about getting through it and feeling accomplished yeah. and yes. actually, you know, and then having all those emotions around that, that's really exciting. Interdisciplinarity seems to inform a lot of your perspectives on course design and teaching practice. 
And I know that you are also a member of uh, the Center for Leadership and Research and Education, which is a very interdisciplinary uh, group. Can you talk a little bit about your connection into that group and the value that you hold for interdisciplinarity as a scientist? Oh, wow. <laughs> just okay. a small <laughs> just question. A, just a small just question. A quick just in a, in a inquiry. quick inquiry. Um, yeah. Well, I, so I was just, somebody reached out to me to say, hey, we were looking to do this. And I, and I was having been a, um, a kind of a known educator in the Brantford campus at the time, and then, uh, then at the Waterloo campus. So I was, I was kind of invited to be part of that executive, you know, founding team to, to envision it. And it is uh, that interdisciplinary um, component of it and transdisciplinary it really is like how do you connect all of these ideas and so um, I think it really is foundational to how I think about science because uh, I uh, in high school I never wanted to ever do any science at all in fact I was fully convinced I was going to be a Shakespearean actress and <laughs> you know uh uh, actually, I wanted to be Henry V, so I don't know. <laughs> they, they weren't that open to that yet at the time. And, and so, um, yeah, I wanted nothing to do with science. And, um, and so my lens, it was really from the arts initially. And then when I threw myself into science for all kinds of reasons and uh, had to make sense of this brand new kind of area that I wanted to have nothing to do with at the time, like before previously, I was teaching myself through stories, through having fun, through creativity, and that transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary kind of, um, you know, connect those connections. And I, and for me, when we think about memory work, um, you know, there's there's repetition, and repetition is, it's effective, but not really that effective. It's the integration, like, is when we take information and we connect it to meaningful things in other areas that we have in our lives, that's yes. where we really have that valuable kind of memory and learning um, as opposed to just kind of, and so I kind of, when I, when I approached science myself, I was connecting it to all of the other things that I, and um, that, and to acquire the science in myself when I was, when I was <laughs> beginning. And so Thinking about research in in in, in uh, education and how do we bring those topics? I mean, there's many ways. Not everybody's going to learn the way that I did, but that's what inspired me, and it was a pathway for me. So I think that there's a lot. Of, there can be for a lot of people that value yeah. of bringing the the different connections in, um, and it can be, you know somebody who's into photography and and you know once you start talking about you know photons and and light and energy and all of these types of things and yes. and and they might not have really been like big into photography yet they're just really interested and all of a sudden that's going to explode the they're thinking about color and yes. and lenses and filters and all of those like so that's just photography or you know, if they're a dancer, and um, I mean, some of the dancers, I, I used to be in healthcare and I was in pain management for the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. These are like athletes. Yes. They'd be yeah. jumping onto, off the stage, onto the table for some pain management. And, um, but, but for them to, their understanding of the body was incredible as, the, as athletes. And, and you'll see that in many athletes. Sometimes it's more body knowledge than it is you know the theoretical like yeah. or the the actual kind of uh, yeah. textbook information that you might have in anatomy but connecting all of these kind of parts whether it's dance to anatomy or you know photography to photons and, <laughs> and all of those kinds of, I think it matters it helps in the learning yeah so to, to take that kind of um objective logic uh evidence that's based on uh, repeatable phenomenon process uh, and, and uh, quantifiable methodology that it really is um, such a strength of the sciences and marry it with all of the traditions and perspectives of more qualitative, emotional, um, performative aspects 
aesthetic considerations. Yes. That's something really, I think, that would enrich the human experience and make people's lives more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and perhaps make them problem solve and see things differently, contribute differently uh, as yeah. a consequence of that. So it's it's really, it's, it's neat that you are a passionate advocate for that and that you've also pursued partnership with others through Cleary uh, to, to actually investigate it from a scholarly perspective. Yes, and, and with Cleary, one of my major goals, something that would be really, I think really valuable for our institution for teaching and learning and, and, um, and scholarship in teaching and learning is that uh, we develop a kind of Mad Libs um, you know what I mean by Mad Libs, yes. where it's kind of like fill in the, yeah. the, the title of your project, but everything else is kind of um, for uh, research ethics approvals for being able to use data in our classroom. And so having sort of something that is consistent, that is quick, that isn't onerous for the, that it's just a way to say, I have research ethics to two years from now, anonymously be able to, or one year, like at some point, yeah. but can be able to use the data from this classroom because teaching is so iterative. Yes. And, and so how do we really like quantitatively create some scholarship yes. in teaching and learning without um, having this type of structure? And so that's something that's really important to me. <laughs> I think that that is a great uh, ambition to have, and, and I'm fully supportive of your pursuit of that. Let's look at the ways in which we can make sure that our uh, teaching is scholarly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> My thanks to Rochelle Monahan for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me for more conversations that celebrate exceptional teaching practices explore diverse teaching philosophies, and discuss the future of higher education, teaching, and learning.